Hello guys. So on countless requests from so many of my students to talk about uh, the refractive surgeries, here I am with the topic. So let's see why actually we do refractive surgery. Why we opt for refractive surgery. See people were going for refractive surgery previously also and people go for refractive surgery now also. But as you see there is a change, there is a changing trend for why actually they are undergoing refractive surgeries. So if you see previously why they were undergoing refractive surgeries because of their vocation, because of their profession was, was the needing it, it was the demand of their profession or if they were in sports because you know that uh, spectacles <coughs> or putting on the contact lenses certainly gives you a limitation. So sports was uh, again uh, important and I think in a way a justified demand of uh, refractive surgeries. Then there was uh, certain uh, people who were just flaunting because of the intolerance of the spectacles and the intolerance of the contact lenses. But slowly and gradually if you see there is a recent trend where the refractive surgery is uh, happening for that indication which is considered to be the least indication in cases of surgeries and that is your cosmesis. So I will not hesitate to say that today the greatest number of refractive surgeries are actually going on for the matter of cosmesis and not only the females but males are turning equally in the ophthalmic OPDs that they don't want to put on the spectacles, they don't want to put on the contact lenses and therefore they want to undergo the refractive surgeries. Then second important thing is when they are frustrated with the use of specs and the contact lenses. Now you would say that this is quite similar to that of cosmesis. No. Now these people do not have a problem in using the spectacles or the contact lenses but the idea is that they have now been frustrated because of long term use or you know the using of contact lenses is quite cumbersome. We have a problem of tolerance so we have overwear syndrome. So all these things have actually led to the uh, uh, feeling that now we don't want to use them at all. And the third important thing is improved unaided visual acuity. So it will lead to the improvement. So that is the most justified use of the refractive surgery. Okay. Now let's come to the classification of the refractive surgeries. Now uh, refractive surgeries can be classified uh, in the different types but according to the different basis like for example one way of classifying the refractive surgery is the type of surgery that you are doing like for example one is kirato refractive procedures when you are operating on the cornea and uh, for the sake of refractive uh, surgery or you can say you are operating on the cornea in order to improve the refractive power. Now why this is important because you know already that there are four refractive surfaces in the eye. What are four? These are anterior surface of the cornea, we have posterior surface of the cornea, we have anterior surface of the lens and then we have posterior surface of the lens. Now amongst these four which one is the most important? So most important is the anterior surface of the cornea and that is why here what we are doing, we are doing kerato refractive procedures. We are doing the surgery on the cornea thereby increasing the curvatures of the cornea. So you know the power of the eyeball depends upon the axial length, it depends upon curvature, it depends upon the refractive index also. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to increase the curvature of the cornea so that anterior surface of the cornea will give you the more important 
power. Then the second important thing is the lamellar, lamellar corneal refractive procedures. So, uh, like uh, we had done one video on corneal keratoplasty, there also you did see that there was a penetrating keratoplasty and then there was a lamellar keratoplasty. So, similarly here also lamellar means the layers, layers or the partial thickness layers or the partial thickness. So, when we are doing the surgery on the cornea but we are not using all the layers of the cornea then that is called as lamellar corneal refractive surgery. Okay, then coming to the next one, the third. The third is laser ablation corneal procedures. Now, this is a very very uh, recent uh, uh, addition where most of the uh, steps of the surgery are actually done by the laser and I think uh, uh, this has actually led to a widespread use of these kind of surgeries because with the advent of the laser we have got better outcomes, we have got good rehabilitation, lesser complications. So, we have tried uh, tend to improve it and we have started doing even for the cosmetic purposes. And then number fourth, we have got corneal shrinkage refractive procedure. So, this is basically based on the those classifications which say that whether you are doing addition or you are doing subtraction, you are increasing the curvature or you are decreasing the curvature. So, if you are leading to the shrinkage of the uh, collagen which is present in the cornea then that is called as corneal shrinkage refractive procedure. Then along with this we could have other kind of surgeries where we are using one or more implant. It can be corneal implant then we can have molding. We can even mold the corneal tissue in order to give it uh, more curvature or the less curvature. And then we have got the lens based procedures. One are your cornea based procedures and one are your lens based procedures. I think now this is very very clear that because the refractive surfaces of the eyeball are two basically anterior and posterior of the cornea and anterior and posterior of the lens. So, if I want to improve the refraction and I want to do the refractive surgery either I will do it on cornea or I will do it on lens. Okay. So, this was one way of classifying the refractive surgeries. Now, there is one more way. There is one more way, way of uh, classifying these refractive surgeries and these are called as keratorefractive surgical procedures. Keratorefractive, kerato means cornea. Always remember whenever I am talking about kerato that always means the cornea. So, they are called as keratorefractive surgical procedures. So, they are based on a number of things. First thing is the location, whether you are doing it superficially, uh, superficially means epithelium, the Bowman's membrane and just the superficial part of the stroma or second it is intrastomal, if you are doing into the deeper layer of the stroma and then it can be peripheral, even you are bypassing that stroma. So, you have superficial, you have intrastromal and then you have peripheral, this is number one. Then number two, number two is the addition. Addition means that you are increasing. So, it can be epikeratophagia, then we have synthetic epikeratophagia, then we have got the other range like we have keratophagia or you are putting the intracorneal lenses or you are putting the intracorneal stromal rings at the level of superficial also, it can be at the level of intrastromal also and it can be at the level of peripheral also. Then we have got subtraction procedures. Subtraction procedures may you are cutting out some part of the cornea. So, that can be at the level of superficial layer. So, that can be PRK photo refractive keratectomy. We have lesic and epilesic. So, slowly and gradually we will be discussing all of these things. Then you have got intrastromal. Intrastromal may we have got lasic, 
wave font guided lasik and intra lasik why i have marked this that this is going to be the most important surgery so you should know that this is actually subtraction procedure number 1 and this is at the level of intra stromal right and then we have got the peripheral that is your wedge resection now coming on to the third one third one is your relaxation in the relaxation you have got the lamellar keratoplasty but here the more important to remember is the radial keratotomy and arcuate keratotomy they are important not because they are done nowadays they are important because they were done and um, that is why when they are asking you about the refractive surgeries now though not many questions have been asked about the refractive surgeries be very very clear okay but keeping in mind that in future you are going to have so many questions from ophthalmology like 10 to 15 uh, they are going to ask now and in future next they are proposing 60 questions so that that means we have to be prepared with more and more topics now so keeping that in mind i am telling you this so radial keratotomy is one thing that was done and uh, it is just similar to icce that is in the cataract surgery so even uh, there also they are asking questions on icce because uh, that was done though it is obsolete now so similar is the, with the rk here and then finally we have got the compression the fourth is the compression so compression actually involves it uh, involves the molding it at the level of the superficial layers and in the periphery it is involving the thermokeratoplasty it involves the compression sutures also so uh, these are the different ways whether we are operating at the level of cornea or uh, lens we are uh, doing subtraction or addition or compression at the level of superficial layers stromal layers periphery whether it is full thickness or it is lamellar in this way we can classify the refractive surgeries i hope this is very very clear okay now coming to the pre operative evaluation now this is the major hurdle and so many uh, phone calls emails messengers and what not i get on this pre operative evaluation because many people are actually got um, jammed at this level because you know this is one surgery where the there is a high risk of complications so stakes are very very high and uh, think if the patient is just getting the surgery for the sake of cosmesis and landed up in complications so uh, that that is why i do not personally prefer suggesting these refractive surgeries to the patients the reason is that the stakes of the complications are very very high and if you are doing it just for the cosmesis sometimes i think it was not justified to take that much of risk so uh, you have to undergo a lot of screening uh, proper history tracking as well as the pre operative examination and counseling of the patient means how much he or she is actually motivated to undergo this refractive surgery can he be convinced to take any other measure how much he dislikes the spectacles or the contact lens if he is having the intolerance and how much amount of intolerance tolerance is there for the spectacles or contact lenses so all these things should always be evaluated now another important thing is ophthalmic examination and i think this is again a very important point from where mcqs can be expected so what are the things that you must take into consideration you should see in the ophthalmic examination when you are going to do the refractive surgery so the very first thing is that you should see the visual acuity you have to see the visual acuity near visual acuity distance visual acuity best corrected visual acuity without correction visual acuity so you should know the visual acuity at all the levels number 2 then do the refraction also find out what is the current spectacle correction is it right or not now other way uh, day only i got a call from one of my students who was undergoing the lasik for the 
correction she was wearing in spectacles and they were not even rechecking it whether it was right or not but somehow just before the surgery they said that let's confirm it and the refractive error came out to be different from what she was wearing so this is a very very important thing don't take it for granted that whatever is the spectacle correction the patient is wearing is the right one maybe the patient is wearing under correction she could, she could be wearing over correction so you you have to be very very cautious don't be uh, complacent don't be biased okay don't be prejudiced you have to take yourself take the readings if there is a dilemma confirm it i i think there is no problem there should not be any hesitation in confirmation because you know it's better to confirm from before otherwise you will be landing up in problem afterwards so always take the visual equity check the refraction okay then number three you have to see what is the amount of manifest refraction that is your undilated this is your undilated refraction and then also see under the dilatation you have to do both the refraction what are these called as that means unaided unaided means you have to do the dry retinoscopy this is called as dry retinoscopy while the one which is under dilatation which is done under dilatation this is called as wet retinoscopy so this could be again asked in the form of mcqs which of the following is must before the refractive surgery all of the following are must except in that form okay then you have to go for the external examination external examination of the eye do the total slit lamp examination thorough slit lamp examination you have to do then check the ocular motility if any motility problem some restriction some fibrosis some palsy anything so you have to do the gross external examination and as i told you you have to do it with the help of slit lamp and when you are doing the slit lamp examination a very very important thing is do the staining also now you will say why staining is required if you have even slightest of abrasion on the cornea and you have to actually do the procedures on cornea that may land up into trouble if you are having any infection at the level of cornea first let that subside don't operate on it if you are having punctate erosions you are having any uh, abrasions then they will stain okay and you will have to postpone or even cancel the surgery and then you also have to see the tear secretion rate why tear secretion rate because here we also have a risk of dry eyes so this is again very very important that when uh, the patient is undergoing actually the refractive surgeries there is a risk of dry eye and that is why you will always have to check total of the eyeball and with a very very important focus on the cornea the tear film uh, whether the amount of lubrication is normal or not the tear formation is normal or not all these things are mandatory all right then come to the examination which is under the investigations so what are the tests that you should do so two tests that are very very important with respect to the topography see again i am saying that because you have to basically change the topography what is the basic idea of doing these refractive surgeries see we are doing refractive surgeries either for the um, myopia or for the hypermetropia or for the astigmatism right or not so basically we are doing the refractive surgeries for any of these three so what we are going to do in cases of myopia we have got actually increased curvature steepening cornea is there so basically what you have to do you have to flatten the central cornea whatever i am telling you this is in terms of the central cornea so you will have to flatten the central cornea similarly if i am talking about the hypermetropia so i have to do the steepening steepening of the central cornea in astigmatism you have to uh, do it in the order of those uh, meridians in which it is given so 
what you have to do is you have to actually change the topography of the cornea or the lens and more importantly it is the cornea because you know cornea is giving you more important refractive surface in comparison to the lens so that is why i am basically concerned to know two very very important things one is the keratometry and second is computerized video keratography first of all what is keratometry keratometry is done by keratometer this will give you central 3 mm corneal curvatures i think most of you must be knowing when we do the uh, biometry also at that time also we require the k reading corneal curvature is required that is called as a k reading this is done with the help of keratometer so here again we require the curvature of the cornea and specially in the optical zone what do you mean by optical zone the central area of the cornea which is around the pupil where you have to actually uh, prepare that stromal bed and there you have to do the surgery that area is called as optical zone so basically we are concerned with the curvature of the cornea in that central optical zone and sometimes what happens the people may be having the um, undiagnosed keratoconus very very early stages of keratoconus so you have to rule out if there is any problem with the curvature of the cornea any disease which is related with the curvature of the cornea so mainly we are focusing on what you called as keratoconus keratoconus so we are quite worried about the keratoconus and the only way to diagnose this keratoconus in the early stages is this your computerized uh, video keratography so i think these two are prerequisites like we always study that there are two prerequisites before the corneal transplantation one is your slit lamp and second is your specular microscopy similarly we have got two prerequisites before the refractive of surgery one is keratometry and computerized video keratography okay now what are the other things keratometry you have done you have done the uh, uh, video keratography also then third important thing is the pachymetry you have to do the pachymetry also because uh, when we are doing the um, refractive surgeries what we are doing we are scraping the corneas so when you are scraping the cornea you are decreasing the thickness so you require some minimum thickness of the cornea especially the stromal area where you have to do the surgery so if that stromal bed is less than that then it is not done or rather it is contraindicated so for knowing that whether this cornea is actually good or not for doing this refractive surgery you should know the total thickness of the cornea and the total thickness of the cornea can be calculated by the pachymetry is this clear right away you are also revising what is keratometer what is keratography what is pachymetry and then we have got the opscan device now this is a optical device and it's a comparatively new device see here i will show you the pic also this is your uh, pachymeter okay this uh, pachymeter i have shown you in your uh, glaucoma video also and this is actually opscan so what is the advantage of this like this is also for thickness but the advantage is that when you apply the pachymeter you are getting the thickness of the cornea at that particular area but this opscan device will help you to get the thickness of the cornea all over so if you want to get the throughout knowledge what is the general thickness of the cornea as a whole then this is better okay now another important thing which is very very important uh, for your mcq purpose is the contraindications and i and as i always say that contraindications are even more important than indications you should know actually where you should not do the surgery contraindications of any surgery are much much more important than the indications of that surgery so number 1 is 
diabetes why we are preventing the patient from diabetes doing this especially if the corneal sensations are not intact so if the corneal sensations are not intact this person may be having any corneal ulcer or any keratoconus or decreased corneal sensations or it may be having any infection over the cornea anything but without he knowing or having the slightest idea that he is having all this so you cannot actually trust on this patient that is why we always try to to avoid doing refractive surgery in these patients number two obviously when uh, there is a pregnancy and lactation uh, because of the general reasons that immunity is very very low and usually we try to do only only those surgeries which are very very urgent so refractive surgery means does not come under those surgeries which cannot be actually postponed then number three it should not be done in those disorders which are actually a kind of uh, autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis we have sle we have uh, polyarthritis nodosa so try to ignore because you know the graft rejection the failure the delayed healing the complications all these are very very common here then immunodeficiency so if the person has pregnancy lactation or he has some immunodeficiency disorder okay or if the person is having abnormal wound healing due to any other reason it can be marfan syndrome allard and loss syndrome it can be a keloid it can it can be hiv anything which has led to the delayed healing okay then see the drugs if the patient is having some drugs which can delay the healing and you know steroids are very very notorious for this antihypertensives and antipsychotics antihypertensives because any time the if the person is taking the antihypertensives and he is not having the controlled bp the person can land up in trouble antipsychotics so uh, when you are doing any surgery on this patient and you know you know psychotic illness should not be there he should be mentally physically socially fit perfect state of uh, health he should be and then we are going to do this surgery okay now talking about the ophthalmic contraindications so uh, we have already seen the general contraindications generally when you should avoid doing the surgery now what are the ophthalmic contraindications so number 1 if the person is having any disorder which can be precipitated like for example if you talk about prk prk means photo refract active keratectomy so if we are doing this what can happen the herpes zoster ophthalmicus can actually reactivate so uh, uh, if you remember i told you this in corneal transplantation also that uh, if the patient has herpes simplex keratitis then we we should not do the corneal transplantation because the herpes simplex interstitial keratitis is the most common form of keratitis that can occur in graft so similarly here also if the person has already have an attack of herpes zoster ophthalmicus you should not do it second important thing if the patient has glaucoma see what happens if the patient has glaucoma the intraocular pressure is very very high so you are not able to do those surgeries intraocular surgery will be contraindicated and sometimes uh, because of the optic atrophy okay the basic purpose for which you are doing the surgery will not meet so his vision may not improve that is why you are not doing in glaucoma then i told you that these patients can land up in dry eye so if a patient already has dry eye if the patient is already have dry eye like for example it can be keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis sicca or it can be facial palsy leading to exposure keratitis or it can be any lid disorder if, due to which the patient is not able to close the eye and that can even lead to the dry eye so that is very very important next important thing is the abnormal corneal shape if the shape of the cornea curvature of the cornea thickness of the cornea anything which is abnormal of the cornea don't try to do the surgery 
then if you have got shape changes induced even by the contact lenses those people who are using hard contact lenses rigid contact lenses from a very very uh, long duration they can have the abnormal shape of the cornea then if patient has high irregular astigmatism then what happens the curvature of the cornea is very very uneven and it will be very difficult to treat it then we have got the corneal ectasias <coughs> corneal ectasias may it can be keratogonous can be keratoglobus we have the pellucid marginal degeneration so basic idea of avoiding these surgeries in the corneal ectasias is that there will be lot of thinning of cornea the, uh, because what happens when these are being ectatic there will be stretching out of the outer coat of the eyeball so this stretching of the outer coat of the eyeball will lead to keratoconus or keratoglobus like this and if we have any active ocular disease any active ocular disease it can be uveitis at the level of lens at the level of retina or we have got degenerations i told you diabetes diabetic retinopathy or retinitis pigmentosa or the retinal detachment now coming to the very first technique that was a uh, starter of the refractive surgeries that was called as the radial keratotomy so we are doing what <clears throat> we are doing tomy so we were giving the incisions or the cuts okay kerato means we were giving in the cornea and they were given radially this was actually given by a uh, russian scientist and it is also accredited with the development of the modern radial keratotomy so if you look here what we used to do suppose this is the cornea here can you see here we are giving the radial incisions here these are the radial incisions that are given now let us see what is the technique how you are doing it so basically suppose uh, mm, we have uh, the cornea here okay this is the cornea so what we are doing we are giving the radial cuts here and basically what portion of the cornea is involved it is the epithelium to the stroma and the knife that we are using is the diamond knife so if you see this cornea from the front suppose this is your cornea and this is the pupil so in this way we are giving the radial cuts in the cornea the spokes of the wheel like appearance and uh, they are superficial so they are going from the epithelium to the superficial stroma not uh, more than that okay and the principle now what is the principle that is very important what happens these sides of the areas which are um, in between these incisions these are actually bulging so what happens where you are giving these incision this will become flattened this will become flattened and where do you do the flattening this you do in the myopia so what we are doing if the patient has myopia about 7 to 8 radial cuts are given all over in the cornea so if i am giving cuts like this 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 all over i am giving about 7 to 8 cuts and these cuts are not through and through otherwise obviously perforation will take place so these cuts which i am giving they are starting from epithelium and they are uh, roughly going towards the superficial stroma so what happens if i have suppose given two cuts here one cut here one cut here so the area which is in between these two cuts will bulge okay and this area and this area where i have given the cuts that will flatten so that will lead to the flattening of the cornea in those areas so that will actually lead to the correction of the myopia okay now what happens how much amount of uh, the ablation has to be done okay that is actually calculated with the help of a formula called as munnerlin's formula so you should also know the name of this formula uh, with respect to the refractive surgeries called as the munnerlin's formula so what happens when you are actually ablating suppose i i have to do some surgery maybe for the myopia or maybe for the astigmatism so what i am doing actually when i am ablating 
I am taking out a lenticule, lenticule of the corneal tissue. This is called as lenticule. Lenticule actually means that it is of the shape of a lens. So, this is concavo convex. So, we are removing a concavo convex or a lenticule type of area from the cornea. Okay, and this will give you what kind of surfaces? Spherocylindrical surfaces, and actually, this will bring a change in the corneal curvature. So, how much amount of this is done? So, for this, you have to remember that each sphero equivalent diopter of myopic correction performed at a 6 mm optical zone. If you are considering that we are ablating an area, central area of 6 mm, okay. So, each sphero um, equivalent diopter of the myopic correction will ablate for one diopter, how much you have to ablate? 12 microns of the tissue you have to do it. So, this is called as Monolin's equation or the Monolin's formula. Okay. Now, see this. If you go about the radial keratotomy, see these are the layers of the cornea. So, we are using this diamond knife here. This is the diamond knife with the help of which we do this radial keratotomy. So, what they are doing that how much actually you have to go deep, how much deep you have to go, this actually depends upon what was the base, uh, previous or the uh, basic thickness of the cornea because you have to go about 85 to 90 percent thickness. You have to cross about 85 to 90 percent thickness. So, because the thickness of the cornea will be different in different individuals, I cannot say one value that you have to go this much. You have to see what is the thickness of the cornea in that person and 85 to 90 percent of that thickness you have to go inside with the help of a diamond knife. Now, see here, what they are saying, the length of the knife blade and the associated depth of the incisions were based on the corneal thickness. So, how much amount of um, depth I have to keep? Suppose this is my diamond knife and this is the end here and this is the cornea. So, how much amount of this blade should go inside? So, I have to set it to about 85 or 90 percent. So, I should know what is this thickness. Then I will set it to the 85 to 90 percent of this and, and then it should go inside. Okay. Now, where we used to uh, do this radial keratotomy? Radial keratotomy was done basically for the moderate myopia. So, it can be low to moderate myopia, we are not using it for very, very high opia, uh, myopia. Why? The reason is that if I want to treat very, very higher degrees of myopia, then I have to give a longer incisions with smaller optical zone. So, if suppose this is a cornea, so optical zone will become small and uh, incisions have to be much larger than before. So, here the chances of complications becomes more and more and that is why we are actually uh, uh, reserving it for the low to moderate amount of refractive surgeries for myopia. Now, what are the complications? The complications are first of all, you know, corneal curvature also faces the diurnal fluctuations. During the waking hours, uh, physiologically also there is a steepening of the cornea, right. So, this thing can actually lead to the under correction or even the over correction. So, uh, suppose you have already done the flattening, okay. So, in the night time it is okay, but in during the day time when there is a more steepening of the cornea at that time the person may be having problem. Then second important thing, while we are giving these incisions over the cornea, obviously we are giving a guarded uh, thickness that is about 85 to 90 percent. So, it is not 100 percent sure that with this 85 to 90 percent incisions, you are just giving the complete treatment or the adequate treatment of that uh, refraction. So, obviously there can be under correction also, there can be over correction also. Now, third important thing, when I am giving the incisions here, 
like so many incisions are given so when i am giving the incision this is also leading to increased in the uneven surface because you know these areas will bulge out well these areas this will bulge this will bulge this will flatten so you are actually creating more of uneven surface due to which the increased astigmatism is also there then what is the problem there is also instability there is also instability of the refractive correction and slowly and gradually there may be hypermetropic shift in this patient because of the healing right then you can always have the chance of perforation and i think this is the most dreadful complication think that you have just um, gone through the refractive surgery radial keratotomy in the patient and instead of 85 to 90 percent you have gone to 90 to 95 percent so obviously the chances of perforation will become more even there can be uh, globe rupture uh, you can go even up to the level of the globe and obviously there are chances of infection so that always go hand in hand whenever you are doing any surgery the chances of infection are always always there okay now another range of complications that was the uh, general complications but now i am talking those complications which are bearable complications not like perforation and bacterial keratitis which are related to the optics so in this pattern the patient may have typical what you call as starburst pattern and the glare can you see this is the um, one thing is the uh, colored halos where you have colored rings of different colors which are found uh, around the bright light starburst appearance can you see this is called as the starburst appearance where you have star like halos uh, scattering this is due to uh, the high degree of irregular astigmatism uh, which is there so these patients can have a problem of starburst halos glare uh, obviously can be there uh, glare is your light sensitivity light sensitivity will be there so due to the uh, scattering of the light from the radial incisions now these things are very very common uh, and that is why now we have abandoned it we are not using the rk now and contraindication now this is again um, important thing for your mcq those people who have typically the work of night driving doing the jobs uh, during the evening time they should not be given this rk so night driving sports person security persons you know because here the chances of perforation are again very high so those who have more chances of perforation more chances of scattering of the light should not be given it Now next is your astigmatic keratotomy. Now this is actually just done for astigmatism only. If you are doing the keratotomy only for the astigmatism, then I will say that this is astigmatic keratotomy. And what you are doing here, we are just giving only the transverse incisions. They can be straight also or they can be just smiley kind of incisions, arcuate shaped incisions, one or two. An important thing is that they will be perpendicular to the steep meridian. Whichever meridian is steep, perpendicular to it, we can give these incisions. Then they can be combined because you know that person may be having the spherical error also. So you can combine it with the LASIK also, PRK also, LASIK also and cataract extraction if required. See here. Can you see here we have given two incisions, the arcuate shape incisions, they are given perpendicular to the steep meridian. Okay. So, uh, this is the in detail actually. Uh, all this information has been taken from the latest edition of Yenov. So, it is a beautiful chapter. If you have time, you can go through it. So, they have actually given you uh, the method of calculating the exact meridian at which you, you have to give the transverse incision or the arcuate incision if the person is having particular steep meridian. Okay. Then the lasers. Now, this is again very, very high yield. What are the lasers that are used for the refractive surgeries? So, basically, you have to remember one very, very important laser that is eczymal laser. An eczymal laser has wavelength of 193 nanometer. Then the second one, this was the first preferred. 
what is the second one the second one is the diode laser that is 680 nanometer and then most recently that we are using is the femto second laser that we also use for the flex femto second laser assisted cataract surgery that is your 1053 nanometer so all three are very very important then this is your quick chart where you can learn the wavelengths because you know lasers are a very important component of ophthalmology and many a times in the recent advances type they can ask you the wavelengths of the different um, lasers. So there are certain ones that you already know like we already know for the NDAG 1064 nanometer then uh, diode 680 we have argon is roughly uh, around 500 and then we have got the uh, argon fluoride, krypton fluoride, xenon chloride, xenon fluoride. So uh, this is your Vibgyor range in which we have got so many lasers. Now I will not say that uh, learn every laser but whatever um, you can learn okay not uh, wasting much of your time you can go through it because some of the lasers are used in other subjects also so you may be having the knowledge from there also but always remember the NDAG laser diode laser argon laser and excimer lasers with the respect to ophthalmology these four lasers are sufficient okay now if i talk about the excimer laser what is actually excimer where uh, from we have got this word excimer excimer means excited dimer so you are using some inert gas and we are using the dimer of that inert gas that is called as excimer. So if you uh, have listened to this, I think you don't have to actually cram it up. You will always remember in your lifetime that excimer is nothing but the excited dimer of an inert gas. And along with this you are getting one halogen so you have argon fluoride argon chloride xenon fluoride xenon chloride like this we are getting the lasers okay so what what is the actually mechanism mechanism is that when they are decaying then they are emitting the uv radiation of 193 this is how excimer laser is working and its wavelength is 193 okay so mechanism of action is photo disruption what is the mechanism of action photo disruption when we learn the NDAG laser there also we learn that it is photo disruption by which um, we are doing this uh, posterior capsulotomy or iridotomy so here also we have photo disruption by which we are ablating the corneal bed now what are the advantages of non excimer so if on, on one hand I have excimer laser and on another end I have got non excimer lasers which one I should prefer. So there are certain advantages when I am using the non excimer because you know the excimer um, lasers were using the gases. So here you do not have any toxic gases okay. Then we have got less of the damage, thermal damage as well as collateral damage because you know uh, the wavelength of these uh, non excimer are very very close to the absorption peak of collagen stroma. So you don't have to peak to a very very high amount in cases of these non excimer lasers. So they are less toxic okay less of thermal damage, less of the collateral damage, better stability is there as well as it is less sensitive to humidity or the room temperature no purging with the inert gases are required so if you look um, all over totally the uh, non excimer lasers are useful having less toxic effects in comparison to the excimer lasers okay now let's see how it is doing the photo ablation we say that it is doing the photo ablation photo disruption so how it is doing so cornea actually uh, what happens it is very very um, efficient at the wavelength of 193 nanometer so what it is doing it is emitting the energy of 193 nanometer that is its wavelength and this wavelength is actually sufficient to break the carbon-carbon bond as well as carbon and nitrogen bond. 
so basically it is breaking the bonds so when we have got uh, the collagen that contains a different bonds we have carbon to carbon bond also and we have got carbon to nitrogen bonds also so they are breaking so what will happen the collagen will actually wrap into the small fragments and then you can remove it so this is how the photo disruption is actually taking place by breaking these bonds okay then we have got the femto second laser femto second laser is a infrared laser and uh, it is emitting you know it is emitting the wavelength of 1053 nanometer now you have to remember a very very important thing what is that a very important thing is that if you take each pulse each pulse of laser light is actually um, uh, lasting for about 10 to the power minus 15 seconds this was asked once in aims also that each pulse is actually lasting for about 10 to the power minus 15 seconds so that uh, comes to roughly about 500 to 800 femtoseconds it's a very very high power uh, laser and the penetration power is also is much better in comparison to the other lasers so that is why most of the recent uh, updates shows that femto second laser is actually doing a good job okay and whenever we are trying to shift the um, surgeries towards the laser we are actually shifting it towards the femto second laser okay so they this they are showing the photo ablation breaking uh, the bonds now something about the photo refractive keratectomy we are doing the keratectomy with the help of photo that is light and for the refractive purposes this was the first widely used procedure that was started doing uh, with the help of eczema laser and this goes way back to 1987 that we used this eczema laser for now what we are doing try to understand it is keratectomy so you are scraping the cornea which layer of the cornea outer layer what is outer layer outer layer means epithelium so basically what we are doing we are first scraping the outer layer of the cornea and then we are applying the laser so obviously it will take time to heal uh, epithelium will also regrow but that will also take time so it takes about four to seven days though they are writing four to seven days i think one week is the minimum which is going to take and during this period because epithelium is scraped the patient will feel discomfort and what happens when it heals actually it can even lead to the scarring so that is a whole procedure what takes place in photo refractive keratectomy see for example if uh, i have all uh, again taken this uh, from the yen off okay now if you're trying to see what we are trying to do we have ablated this cornea uh, epithelium okay so we have removed the epithelium here and then we are putting these laser energy okay so what you are doing you can see the flattening here so this is how we are doing the photo refractive keratectomy for your uh, myopia that is uh, for your um, uh, refraction so if i want to do it for hypermetropia i will do the peripheral ablation so when peripheral area is ablated there will be relative central steepening see the idea is there that for the myopia we require the flattening of central cornea and for the hypermetropia i require steepening now i cannot steepen so for myopia i can flatten the central cornea for hypermetropia i will flatten the peripheral cornea so there will be relative central steepening okay now see this what are the people who are undergoing this photo refractive keratectomy now there is one thing all those people who are actually ineligible who are not eligible for lasik only those people are undergoing the photo refractive keratectomy now a days so uh, what are those people those people who have got uh, uh, lower degrees of refractive error so uh, we are not giving them less sick okay and uh, if you uh, think uh, 
that uh, LASIK is contraindicated in these people, then also we can go for the photorefractive keratectomy. Now, for example, what uh, is done here? As I told you that what you are doing, you are just first removing the epithelium, okay, and then you are ablating. So, what are the layers that you are ablating? You are ablating the Bowman's layer and the anterior corneal stroma. So, most of the places what you are ablating, the stromal bed that you are ablating consists of the Bowman's layer as well as the anterior stroma. So, what are the things that you can treat it with, with it? You can treat myopia. Myopia that you are treating is up to 6 diopters. Hypermetropia, you are treating again low to moderate. Low to moderate, hypermetropia you can treat and astigmatism up to, up to 3 diopters we can treat. Astigmatism up to 3 diopters. So, what happens if you compare this photorefractive keratectomy with the LASIK? So, you have got lower degrees of refractive error that is correctable. You can treat higher degrees of refractive error by the LASIK, but if the LASIK is uh, not suitable for that person, you can do this photorefractive keratectomy. Also, we have got this lower epithelial helix in comparison to the LASIK here. Okay. Then, coming to the procedure. So, how actually we do this uh, PRK? So, uh, every time you do the refractive surgery, you have to first anesthetize the cornea. So, you have to make the cornea numb, then you have to remove the epithelium. Now, when you remove the epithelium from the cornea, how we can do it? We can do it with the help of a scrubber. Corneal scrubbers are there, sponges are there. We have got automated brushes which can peel off the epithelium or we can even use the alcohol, right? Then what you are doing? Then your stromal bed is created. Then you are applying the laser. So what laser we are applying? Either NDAG laser, eczema laser and this is applied on the what? Bowman's membrane as well as the superficial stroma for how many seconds? For about 30 seconds to 60 seconds. So, for roughly about a minute you can say for one minute we are applying and then you have to do the padding and bandaging because basically we have created a uh, abrasion over it. So, we have to do the padding and bandaging and you have to keep it covered for about 48 to 72 hours you have to keep it covered. Now, many a times one thing that we are using is the metomycin C. This is again important. So, why I want to use this metomycin C? This is actually applied for about 90 seconds so that you do not have the corneal haziness for the prevention also and for the treatment also. And when we use this metomycin, that is called as M lasic. M is metomycin. Okay. So, these are the steps they have shown. They have first anesthetized here. They have given the anesthesia here. Then we, they are scraping the epithelium. Then they are applying uh, what you call as laser and finally you are getting the results. Now, in the post-op care, you have to do the pechic. You have to give the cycloplegics for the pain relief steroids for the inflammation you have to give the tear drops because there is a scraping gritty sensation then we have the chances of the dry eye and the bandage soft contact lenses for providing the uh, moisture content now what are the complications that you can suspect even with this the patient can have pain now, decentration of the ablation zone, that is very, very important. Suppose you are ablating uh, the stromal bed, okay, after removing the epithelium, that area should be central because if the, that area is not central, what whole of the axis will be shifted. Then we can have the corneal haziness, glares, halos. So, what are the differences? See, if you look here, this is your normal one. So, this is your starburst appearance. I told you, no, star-like appearance. This is your starburst appearance. Well, this is your hello where you are getting the circular haziness. This is called as hello. Okay. Then you can have um, the delayed epithelial healing. We can have central islands of the cells that are accumulated. We can have even ulcers. It can hamper the sensations of the cornea. We can have the increased intraocular pressure also as well as the hemorrhages. So, look at the things we have got. See, glares, hello, central islands, even hemorrhages. 
could be there. So there are a lot of complications that we can expect here. And now finally we come to your piece of cake that is your LASIK. LASIK is actually the laser in situ keratomiliosis. Laser in situ keratomiliosis, what is it? This actually reshapes the cornea by using the laser beam and this was invented by Barraquer in 1949. So this is actually more sophisticated uh, one and it is doing more predictable changes because it is altering the refractive power of the eye by calculated change in the corneal curvature. So here we are going in a more calculated manner and this is used for treating low to high degree of refractive errors even the astigmatism okay now the historical review is long way back from 1949 and now we had started even the wavefront LASIK technology in US that came in 2003. So 1949 to 2003 there was a long way of the uh, journey of the refractive surgeries okay. Now this is again very very important and this is not only important for the academic purpose but also for your personal purpose because you know now uh, days nobody wants to wear the spectacles everybody wants to get this LASIK. So analyze yourself are you a right patient or not. So your age should be more than 18 years of age, your refraction should be stable at least for a year, your cornea should be healthy and thickness should be normal. So if, if it is less than 450, it is contraindicated because the residual bed that I require should be at least 250 microns and along with this the scraping that we are doing is about 180 microns. So if you are not having at least 450 then obviously you are not fit for going this surgery then if you are having any pregnancy lactation all those systemic diseases in which it was contraindicated any ophthalmic disease in which it was contraindicated because it can lead to the reactivation or if you are using contact lenses for a very uh, long time okay so uh, basically uh, the use of contact lenses itself is not a contraindication but if it has led to the alteration in the chain or the change in the shape of the cornea then obviously it becomes a contraindication. Then we have also if the patient is already wearing the contact lenses then he will have to discontinue these lenses for a few days prior to the examination and surgery because you know definitely when the patient is wearing the contact lenses for a very long time it has um, bound to leave some impact or the change in the shape as well as curvature so let it bounce back to its normal one. Okay, now come to the examination. Now examination may again you will have to look for the visual equity, the slit lamp, the intraocular pressure, the measurement of the pupillary size. Now this is important. Why I want to measure the pupil? Because uh, you know what happens? The optical zone that you are creating where you are going to do the surgery should be more than the pupil. So that is very very important. You have to see the topography, keratometry, pachymetry, again refraction that everything you have to go for as well as even we are doing the indirect ophthalmoscopy to see the retina. Now coming to the surgical procedure. Now surgical procedure may again first I have to do the numbing of cornea I will have to anesthetize it. Now then I have to mark the cornea where actually I will do the surgery okay nothing should be uh, on the basis of just the fiction you have to actually mark the area where you will be doing that surgery so you have to do the marking. Then third thing you have to apply the rings. I will show you how we are doing uh, the rings that is we are applying. So suppose this is your cornea. So on two ends we are putting these suction rings. So why we are doing C? When you are putting these uh, suction rings there are two things first of all one is that it is stabilizing the eye you have fixed it secondly you are also getting a guide where i have to take this micro keratome so that is very very important okay then you will have to moisten the cornea 
Now, use of this instrument is again very, very important, which you are using for making the flap. So, suppose this is your cornea. So, with the help of your microkeratome, you are creating a flap. How much? 130 to 160 microns uh, or 180 microns we are using like this. So, we are not removing it totally. We are putting it a hinge here so that we have a guide in repositioning it also. So, with the help of a micro keratome, I am creating this flap. We are moistening it. Then we are doing the ablation with the help of eczema laser and you are putting it back. So, your um, this thing, uh, the flap that you are creating, you can say is about 1 50 microns and the residual bed that I require is again at least 250 microns right so that comes to about 400 microns so you cannot take just fix to fix neck to neck so your cornea should be more than 450 microns so if it is coming less than this 450 microns do not take the risk of doing this refractive surgery now see this a very very important tissue how much amount of tissue that can be removed or how much amount of refractive error that can be corrected depends upon the original thickness how much is your original thickness on that basis i can decide how much i can remove and how much i, I can remove will decide how much amount of refractive error i can correct therefore very very high refractive errors can be addressed only by the intraocular procedures and not by the scraping procedures all right so see here what we are doing here we are doing the anesthetization in the first step then number two we are creating the flap number three putting down the laser and then creating the um, the stromal bed then number five putting the flap back and can you see finally you have got what you called as flattening of the cornea we have got the treatment of myopia done now if i talk about these micro keratomes which are used for this uh, flap making they are different ones we have got first generation second generation third generation fourth generation in the first generation they were just the linear cutting type then we started using the rotational type then we started using the pendular type and now nowadays we are using the laser keratome so that is called as a bladeless surgery is that we study even in the fake emulsification that uh, the flex will be a bladeless surgery we are not using any knife for that so see here so i wanted to show you also how actually it is done in the first step we are just putting the la okay then see we are putting the suction rings can you see these are your suction rings are applied and these suction rings are actually leading to the raised intraocular pressure and uh, this will help you in stabilization as well as giving you guide then see number three you are applying the micro keratome so that you are getting a hinged flap there right then what you are doing you are folding the flap so that you start getting that stromal bed scene where you have to do the ablation then you are doing this stromal ablation here we are doing the stromal ablation and finally see we have beautifully repa uh, repositioned or replaced the flap back now post-op so what you are going to do in the post-op, I will have to take care of infection, antibiotics, I will have to take care of the inflammation, steroids, I have to do the follow-up very, very gen um, religiously one day. So it is your 1336. So it is one day, then you have got one week. Okay, so it is 11336. One day, one week, three week, three month and then six months you have to go then you have to avoid anything related to the eye there no shower hot bath swimming uh, wearing protective glasses gears any sports so any amount of eye rubbing so this is not there that you can't rub your eyes a whole of the life but at that time till the time the proper healing is uh, uh, is taking time you don't have to do all these things now coming to the complications so we have got whole lot of complications related to this we can have intraoperative complications again the post-operative complications so if you look at the intraoperative complications i will say it will be mainly flap 
related complications. So, uh, to be short, remember that these are the flap related complications. It can be an incomplete flap, it can be a very, very thin flap, means it should be about 150 microns on an average. So, if, it, if you are putting a very, very thin flap or if you have uh, landed up in the penetration of that flap that is called as the buttonhole flap. So, if the there is a penetration of flap or you can have more thickness of the flap so we can have the full thickness also or you, you remember we have to keep the flap like a hinge. So, if you have led to the complete removal free cap so thin flap, thick flap, full thickness flap or you have button holding of the flap or you have uh, the free flaps so that can be there. Then you can have the epithelial defects when you are removing the epithelium and adequate hydration is not there. So, that can be there. Then we have the ablation uh, complication. So, area where you are doing the ablation, there you can have the islands, okay, particulate matter can be there. There can be, you know, problem with centration if the proper optical zone is not in the center. Then there can be under correction also, there can be over correction also. So, uh, in total you can say that these complications are similar as we have studied before also. Then what are the other things? So, the complications, the complications that you can take place uh, afterwards, they are uh, more important. Uh, sometimes what you see there, that there is a collection of the debris. So, that debris is mostly the meibomian gland, then we can have the displacement, flap displaced from its place, you can see there, then the problem of halos, the glare, the light sensitivity, they may even increase. Okay, we can have small punctate erosions because there was a problem of dry eye due to that there can be a problem and then there is a thing called as diffuse lamellar keratitis, diffuse lamellar keratitis. So, if you see this diffuse lamellar keratitis, it is called as Sands of Sahara syndrome. Why it is called so? I will show you something and you will come to know by it your, uh, yourself only. See, this is your Sands of Sahara syndrome. Can you see on one side uh, you have got this diffuse uh, lamellar keratitis and this is your sense of Sahara. Can you see the similarity? That is why it is called as the sense of Sahara syndrome. So, basically what are the advantages of the LASIK over the PRK? First of all, the pain. Pain is very, very less in LASIK. We have got early recovery of vision, very less haziness, post-operative haziness, very, very less. Correction that you are doing is for higher refractive errors like myopia up to 12 diopters, hypermetropia 4 diopters and astigmatism up to 5 diopters. Then there is a thing called as laser sub epithelial keratomyliosis. So, what is this laser sub epithelial keratomyliosis? So, main thing is it is sub epithelial. We are working beneath the level of epithelium. This was introduced by uh, the chameleon in 1999 and uh, this is actually combining two things. One is was your PRK and one was your LASIK. So, what you are doing, again you are removing the epithelial flap same by the alcohol that we were doing in the cases of the PRK and then what we are doing, then we are doing the LASIK there. So, we are doing anesthetization, we are doing trefining, you are removing the um, epithelium by the alcohol, you have separated this um, epithelium and then you are doing the stromal ablation like we were doing these this. So, these steps will be from PRK and then rest of the steps are of LASIK and this is your LASIK sub epithelial that is called as and even over the flap we are putting the bandage of contact lenses. See, so basically we are doing the LASIK below the level of epithelium or sub epithelium. Now, what are the advantages? Why I want to do it? The advantages is that you can do it in the relatively thin cornea, lesser corneal ectasia. We have got lesser uh, flap related complications. The myopic correction will be more and there will be lesser incidence of the dry eye. 
Now disadvantages. See, there are three main disadvantages. Post-operative pain is more, post-operative haziness is also more and there is a delayed recovery in these patients. Now, in order to meet these problems of delayed uh, recovery, more of haziness and more of most post-operative uh, post pain, we can do the epilasic. What is epilasic? Epilasic was introduced in 2003. And basically it has everything same as LASIK, everything same as LASIK except that the epithelial flap is created with the epikeratome. Epikeratome, we are not using alcohol or that scrubber, automated corneal scrubbers, we are not using, we are actually using the epikeratome. So what you are doing, when you are using this epikeratome, we have got better control over the flap. So, this is moved slowly over the cornea which is giving a better control. So, what are the advantages? We are not using the alcohol. That is the first and foremost thing. We are not using the alcohol because alcohol was an epitheliotoxic. So, this has led to the lesser pain, lesser haziness and lesser time for the healing. So these three were the uh, complications or the disadvantages that we were having with the LASIK. So, I think we have actually met with all three disadvantages with the help of this epilasic. Finally, we come to the wave font that is customized eczema laser refractive surgeries. It is actually used to correct the higher order abrasions. Um, in addition to the spherocylindrical abrasions, so they are doing, in addition, they are also addressing the higher order abrasions. So, this is giving you better results in terms of the visual acuity, in terms of the contrast sensitivity, your image quality, your optical properties. So, this is much, much advanced. Now, we have got different types of customized ablation, right? We have got waveformed, we have got corneal topography guided one and we have got the C lesic. So, if you look here, we have got two kind of things. One is your corneal topography and one is your wavefront abrometry. The corneal topography you can see with the help of the orb scan as well as the pentacam. While if you look at the wavefront abrometry, this is done with the help of Hartman shack sharing and the ray tracing. Just remember the names. I know this is um, slightly tough because you know this is uh, of the scope of the PEGs. So we will uh, limit its uh, description to name only. Now, what are the advantages? The advantages of this customized uh, LASIK are that you are getting higher quality of vision, you are having lesser invasion and it is also correcting the irregular astigmatism. Next, we come to the index. Index means intrastromal corneal ring. So, you should know its full form also. In, inside the stroma, we are putting the corneal rings. These are actually made up of uh, PMMA, polymethoxy, methacrylate. Now, can you see this? This is a very beautiful way uh, of uh, describing actually what is done by index. So, in the first figure, can you see this is your rounded manner it is standing here. Now, they have put the hands here. So, these are the work which is done by the index by the corneal ring. So, when they are actually uh, putting these uh, uh, rings over the sides, there is uh, consecutive flattening of the cornea which is taking place. So, this is how the index or the intercorneal stroma rings are working. So, the ring segments are flattening the cornea in a similar way. So, what we are doing, we can uh, uh, create some grooves inside the stroma and then we can put these intacts.
Then we also have intraocular refractive surgeries. I told you that when you have to treat very, very high degrees of refractive errors, uh, then we have to do the intraocular refractive surgeries. Uh, there you have to do two things. Either we are putting the fake refractive lenses or we are changing, exchanging the lens. That is called as refractive lens exchange. The fake refractive lenses. See, fake refractive lenses means that you are putting additional lenses. So, these lenses are actually put between the cornea and the lens. Okay. Then we have got different kind of lenses. One is your angle supported. Angle supported lenses will be supported in the angle. Suppose this is the cornea here and we have the iris. So, they will be uh, applied here in the angle. While second is your iris claw. So, they are actually holding the iris from both the sides. Well, um, some of them will be put in the posterior chamber. So, they are similar to that of the intraocular lenses that we are doing after the cataract surgery. Now, which patients have to be selected for the fakic IOLs? All those patients who are having very high myopia, high hypermetropia or the LASIK is contraindicated, cornea very, very thin or if there is corneal decompensation present. Corneal decompensation means endothelium. So, if the endothelial density is very, very um, less then you can do it but it should be minimum how much it should be minimum of 2250 to 2500 because you know endothelium decompensation means corneal haziness so you have to be very very careful similarly they are saying that anterior chamber depth if you are excluding the corneal thickness it should be at least 2.8 mm the angle, the angle should be open, the width at least 30 degrees and there should not be any eye pathology apart from the refractive error. Next we come to refractive lens exchange. So, when you are exchanging the lens here, this is also called as the Fucala's operation where you are doing the... Um, cataract extraction and IOL implantation you are doing and this IOL that you are going, giving is the better quality and catering more refractive needs of the person. Then we can also try for the multifocal IOLs. Uh, in the multifocal IOLs, we have got uh, extreme uh, kind of uh, uh, patients where they require the correction of the vision at all the levels, the near level, the intermediate levels and the long distance levels. So, they have maximum uh, coverage from these IOLs having both refractive and the diffractive technologies, right. Then finally, we come to something what is called as the conductive keratoplasty. Conductive keratoplasty is actually a non-laser refractive procedure which is applying a low energy radio frequency. It is a plasty. So, it is a kind of uh, uh, oculoplasty where we are applying the thermal energy to the cornea not the laser energy and this is indicated in the patients who are having presbyopia or the hypermetropia after the age of 40 years. So, what we are doing, we are using the radio frequency energy that is going into the corneal stroma due to that heat it is shrinking and therefore what is happening, bands are formed and due to these bands steepening will occur and obviously steepening will correct the presbyopia or the hypermetropia. So, with this we have come up to the end of the refractive surgeries. I hope you must have benefited from this. Now, it will be easier for you to comprehend when you listen about the RK or PRK or astigmatic keratotomy, what is LASIK, what is LASIK and what is apilasic, what are the different uh, rays that you are using, what are the different lasers that you are using and how one is advantageous from other. Keep on uh, studying and keep on showering your uh, love and warmth. I really uh, feel boosted up and motivated by so much of your love and affection. That gives me more uh, motivation to bring even more and more academic and motivational stuff in front of you. Uh, do tell me in the comment section, how did you like the video? What are the other videos that you like me to prepare on? Be safe, be uh, motivated and happy ophthalmology.